I do love that song that we just sang, especially that phrase um, that says, uh, to ask the Lord to lead us and to make his way plain before our face. And that's a prayer of so many of us that we would do the Lord's will if we would just have him make it plain to us. And that's my heart's prayer and many of yours as well. Uh, turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Last time I preached, I preached in the book of Jude, um, and I preached the entire book of Jude, which is, of course, just one chapter. And so tonight I was talking to Brother uh, Collinson, and he asked if I was preaching the entire book of Jeremiah this time. Um, I won't, just for sake of time. Um, I am known for preaching short, and that might actually break my record if I preach the entire book. But we won't chop that off tonight. We'll maybe save that for a future date. Jeremiah chapter 17. Tomorrow, April 4th, is the 81st anniversary of the strange disappearance of the Lady Be Good. The Lady Be Good was a B-24 bomber that had left its base in Libya, North Africa, to bomb the city of Naples. The plane and her crew of nine men set out at 2.15 p.m. on April 4th, 1943. They reached their target, dropped their bombs, and turned around to head home at 7.50 p.m. Just after midnight, the crew radioed to say that their automatic direction finder wasn't working and to ask for the location of their base. And then the Lady Be Good and her crew simply vanished. Logically, it was assumed they had run out of fuel and crashed in the Mediterranean Sea. A search and rescue mission was launched, but they failed to find any trace of the aircraft or its crew. All nine men on board were presumed dead. On the screen there, you can see a map of their route. I love maps, so it's helpful for me to kind of visualize where they're going. They're going from their base there at the bottom of the screen in Benghazi, all the way up to Naples, and heading back. They should have reached their home base uh, roughly around 12.30, maybe as late as 2.30. It wasn't until 15 years later that the Lady Be Good would be found. But the plane was not in the Mediterranean. It was in the desert, 440 miles past its base. The plane was in remarkably good condition. It apparently had run out of fuel and gently descended to the desert floor. The airmen had all survived the crash and had attempted to walk north through the desert to find help. Unfortunately, none of them made it. There was a simple answer to the mystery of the Lady Be Good. While heading home, the plane caught a tailwind. The instruments showed the plane nearing home long before the men expected. There's no way we're back to base. We have hours to go, they must have thought. And choosing to believe their intuition over their instruments, they flew on, leaving their base far behind, and heading straight into the desert to their own deaths. They had enough fuel. They had enough operational instruments. They had every instrument on board that they needed to safely navigate back to their base. The point of failure was not their instruments, but it was what they chose to trust. We're going to look tonight at Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, and my question for you tonight is, who will you trust? Look with me at verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Jeremiah was a priest and a prophet who was ministering in the city of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom that we call Judah. The core of his message is seen very early in the book. He's called by God to go and preach a very simple message to the people of Judah. And this is what it says. See, I have set this day, see, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdom to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Jeremiah was called to preach a two-part message a message of cursing and of blessing, a message of tearing down and a message of rebuilding. And so now we see in Jeremiah chapter 17, our text for tonight, that he's continuing this message of tearing down and rebuilding. He's continuing the message of judgment and blessing. And here there's a simple message. Judgment if you trust mankind, blessing if you trust God. The first part of this, of course, is the warning against trusting man. And we see that there in verses 5 through 6. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. So I think a good question for us to ask is, what does it look like for us to trust man? What does it actually mean? The passage here describes it in two parts. The first part is making flesh his arm. That's literally the idea of making human flesh your strength. 
And then it is in your heart departing from the Lord, which is the idea of literally turning your heart away from God. So in the context of ancient Judea, this would have looked like making compromising treaties with the nations around him, maybe making a politically advantageous marriage with the daughter of another king, or hiring a mercenary army. So we know what it looked like in their day, right? This is what it looked like for them to put their trust in men. But we don't have that sort of opportunity today, right? We're not gonna make a politically advantageous marriage to become a king somewhere, right? At least I don't think that's any of our aspirations, maybe this. Um, but we have a different opportunity for us to trust man. So let's ask, what does it look like for us today to put our trust in man? I just wrote down uh, six different ways that I see, even in my own life, a temptation to put my trust in man. The first thing is a chameleon approach to life and relationships. A chameleon approach to life and relationships. You guys know what a chameleon is, right? It's a little lizard that can change its color to match its surroundings. Man, I know sometimes I enter social settings and I can be a chameleon. I can just kind of blend in and go with the flow. It's easier that way, right? And sometimes it's good for us to kind of adopt the, the tone. If you're in a formal setting, you want to be more formal. If you're in a casual setting, you want to be more casual. But there's a way for us to enter a space and become a chameleon that is unhealthy for us and, dis and displays that we actually have our trust in man. One of the things that I grappled with a while ago was how would I introduce myself? Um, especially in places like the gym or when I was out and about in town, um, there's two ways I could introduce myself. Because oftentimes people say, what's your name? And the next question is what? What do you do for work, right? And so I could say, I'm a pastor. Boom, I've just labeled myself. I'm a Christian, I have standards, I have values. Um, there's a whole bunch of pack, a whole package that comes along with that, that label, right, when I say I'm a pastor. Or I could say, I'm a firefighter. And that completely changes the expectations. It's like, wow, he's a hero, he's a community servant, everyone loves a firefighter. And so the temptation was for me to walk into a room and be like, I'm a firefighter. And the Lord convicted me about that. He was like, why do you feel like you want to lead with that? Why is that your lead statement instead of pastor? And to be completely honest with you, is because I was tempted to trust man. I valued the opinions of people around me more than I valued who I really am before God and who God has called me to be. The second thing that for me is an evidence of trusting man today is that people are the first thing I turn to when something goes wrong. I'm sure you've had it like I have where something goes wrong in your day, something frustrating happens, and the first thing you think is, oh, I gotta tell so-and-so, I gotta tell my, fr my friends or tell my family, right? And there's nothing bad necessarily with carrying your burdens to other people. We're commanded to do that in scripture. But if your first response to every frustration is to call someone into vent, is your trust really in God or is your trust in man? And then number three, I, I use relationships to medicate, distract, or to serve myself. There's all sorts of relationships we can do this with. It could be a romantic relationship or it could just be a friend or it could be a coworker. There's all sorts of ways we can use other people to make ourselves feel better. And that's a modern way in which we put our trust in man rather than in God. The next one is, I value saying what people want to hear over being truthful. Man, that's just so easy for us to do, isn't it? Our culture doesn't really care about small white lies. And so we can think, man, just make someone feel better. So I'll just say something nice, just go along with the flow, just keep everything smooth. And that's a modern way of putting our trust in man. And then another one for me is other people's opinions determine my decisions and actions. You know, whenever I go to approach a big decision in my life, ideally, I would crowd out the competing voices around me and just say, God, what do you want from me? God, I'm ready to do what you would have me do. But if you're like me, the temptation is to think, well, if I did this, if I made this decision, then so-and-so would think this of me. Or if I made this decision, then so-and-so would think this of me. And it's so easy for us to filter our decisions through what would other people think. And again, the Bible tells us there's value in seeking counsel. So there's a, there's a balance to this as well. But the fact is, so many of us don't just seek counsel, we seek affirmation and approval from everyone around us. And then the last one is, I build my security on what others can do for me. And this can happen in subtle ways. This could be um, looking to people for their connections and the, the people they can plug you in with, the friendships they have, the toys they have that you can play with. Um, and that's a way that we put our trust in others instead of trusting in God. The passage then goes on in verse 6 to tell us the results of trusting man, the results of trusting man. It says there, he will be like the heath in the desert. That's an unusual phrase, not something we're used to hearing. Um, the words there literally mean he will be like a juniper in Arabah. This is the idea of being alone. A juniper is a hardy tree. Um, I don't know if you guys ever worked with juniper trees. They have thick leaves and they can hold a lot of moisture. And so they're highly drought resistant. But no tree, not even a juniper, can survive forever in the desert. Um, growing up, I was on a, lived on a farm and the, the sand that we the, the, the ground that was on the farm was pretty sandy, and so it, was, it would quickly dry. It would not hold water after rain. And so I remember several times trying to plant a tree in one specific spot of the farm, 
And we would plant the tree, and it would be, have you know, leaves on it, and we'd keep it watered for a few months. And then after a few months, you think, it's probably, it's probably pretty well established. We don't need to water it as much. And so you kind of back off in the water. And twice this happened, where we back off in the water, and the tree dies. Well, it was wrong. There was nothing wrong with the tree. It was the soil it was planted in. It couldn't hold the water by its roots. And so the water would just evaporate away or drain away, and the tree was left dry. And so that's the picture here. Now, this, this area he's talking about, the desert, is, um, is the word Arabah. And Arabah is this area just, uh, out, just very near to the Dead Sea. Has anyone been here? I'm curious. Has anyone been to the Dead Sea? A few? Great. I'd love to go there someday. That's one of my goals. Maybe when it settles down a little bit over there, I'll get a chance to go. Um, but this is the area he's talking about. Now, if I were to come to you and say, hey, let's plant a tree, OK? So first thing we do is we, we pick a species. And I say, you know, I've chosen the juniper tree, because junipers are drought resistant. They're hardy trees. It's a great tree. They grow nice and big. So we're going to use a juniper. And then let's, let's find a place to plant it. And I say, I've got the place. Here's the picture. You guys are like, what are you thinking? Why did you plant a tree there? That water you can barely see in the corner there is salt water. And the air around there is, filled, is full of salt. And the salt has built up on the shore there to the point where nothing grows on the shore of the, sea, of the Dead Sea. It's a desert for a good reason, because there's water around, but it's so salty that it kills everything. And we see that here in verse 6 again. It says, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. And so this is the picture here. God is making a clear point for us. When we place our confidence in man, it's like choosing to plant a tree here. This is the result we can expect. Those trees I mentioned that we planted on the farm, they lived for a few months. They looked good for a while, but eventually, the fact of the matter was the soil would not hold the water they needed and they would die. And that's the result we can expect. Though things might look good on the outside while we put our trust in mankind, the end result is always dryness and death. I'm reminded when I think about this, this story of water versus dryness, I'm reminded of the story of when Jesus met a very thirsty woman outside the well of Samaria. Her life was a perfect example of trusting in man. Jesus called her. Jesus went out of the way to call her out for the way she went from relationship to relationship, seeking fulfillment. But every time, she came up thirsty. In response, Jesus said this. This is from John 4. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up to everlasting life. This is what Jesus offers us, but how many times do we choose the desert instead? How many times do we say, you know what, I'd rather, I'd rather trust in mankind. I'd rather put my dependence on other humans. So first we see dryness, and then we see insecurity as a result of trusting in man. At the top of my to-do list, every day I look at it, there's a quote that I heard a few years ago from a sermon. This is the quote. I can't remember who the preacher was. It says, insecurity is placing my confidence or trust in people and things that could be taken away from me. There are only two things in this world that cannot be taken away from you. Your relationship with the living word, Jesus, and your relationship with the written word, the Bible. You know what? So often we turn to people for satisfaction, and the fact is people can be taken away from us. I struggled, especially in college, with putting a lot of stock in friendships. I still love friendships, but especially in that season of life, I had grown up in a small church, I was homeschooled, didn't have a ton of friends growing up, and so now here I was in college with all these like-minded people my age, tons of friends, and I put so much effort and so much investment into friendships only to find that inevitably people could not carry the weight of expectations I placed on them. And so over and over again, I found myself being frustrated by people who would forget to invite me to a party or uh, let me down in some other way. And over and over again, I had to see, wait a second, this isn't where my, where my identity is supposed to be found. This is not where my trust is supposed to be placed. And so we find great insecurity when we put our trust in man. And then the last result we see of trusting man is that we miss out when the rain comes. I think it's so interesting the way verse 6 ends. Uh, let's see, actually, it's in the middle of verse 6. It says, For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh. What's that talking about? Why is it saying he shall not see when good cometh? This is the idea here. He's saying, for that tree planted in the desert, it doesn't matter if it finally rains, because that tree's dead now. 
that tree has been starved of water for so long that you could pour water on that thing and it would do absolutely no good for it. And he's saying, God's saying here, that's what you are like when you put your trust in man. When you spend your life putting all your confidence in what people can do for you, putting all your trust in people, then the day will come where you'll need God to show up in your life, but it'll be too late. Or the day will come where you see God blessing other people's lives and you'll say, man, it feels like I'm past hope. And we know that there's grace. We know that God is able to restore and bring a way back. But there's a way for us to live our lives where we are so dry and crusty that we completely miss out and disregard what God is doing all around us. He's continuing this illustration about the tree in the desert. The tree is dead now. So when the good rain comes, it's too late for the tree. When I've set my eyes, my heart, and my confidence on people for my security, I miss out on the blessing of seeing God at work. In fact, God could be working all around me, and it's as if I'm dead to it. So as I studied this passage, I thought about, okay, why do we trust man? You know, why is this a command even, why do we even need to have this command? We know we do it, right? We all know we have this tendency of trusting man, but why do we do it? And here's just a few things that I thought of that are reasons why I tend to trust man, and I think a lot of us would identify with this. The first one is because they're visible and tangible, right? So when we call a friend, they can give us a response and say, man, that stinks. I can't believe that person did that to you, right? So we had that, that tangible response from another person. Whereas sometimes when we talk to God about our things, it feels a little more distant. It feels a little bit more like we have to wait and see what God's going to do in response to the situation. Secondly, we, we trust in man because they have the power to affect our lives negatively or positively. I think this especially with peer pressure. Even as adults, we experience peer pressure. We think of that as being like a teenager thing, but as adults, we experience this in a real way, where there's this pressure that if I stand out from the crowd, if I stand out as the Christian in my workplace, or if I stand up and do the right thing, I could be viewed as not a team player or as a weirdo Christian. And so we experience this peer pressure all around us, and that's one of the reasons why we trust man, is because they have the power to affect our lives for, for bad or for good. And then because it feels good to be part of a crowd. Um, maybe it's political tribalism, maybe it's church denomination tribalism, maybe it's family tribalism. I think one of the reasons why so many of us fail to trust God and fail to even stand for truth is because we are crippled by trust in man. We are so crippled by our trust in man that we can't hold an unpopular opinion. And so these are some of the reasons why we trust in man. So Jeremiah has given his curse here in verses 5 and 6. And then moving on to verse 7, we see the blessing. Verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So we're familiar with this phrase, this idea of trusting God, but what does it actually mean? What does it look like on the ground for us where we live now to trust God? Verse 7 tells us, Blessed is the man who trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. It's simply found in his character. It's really that simple. We, we trust God by understanding who he is. And so there's a few things that requires for us. First of all, we have to know what he says about himself. I think one of the reasons, again, why so many of us turn to trusting man is because we can see them, we feel like we can figure them out, we can understand them. And we've not actually taken the time to look into God's word, to fellow, fellowship with him, to listen to the Holy Spirit prompting. And so we aren't as familiar with the voice of God. We aren't as familiar with the leadership, with the presence, with the very real support and strengthening arm of our God. And so we turn so often to mankind because we're simply unfamiliar with the character of the God that we're called to trust. And then another, another thing that's valuable for us in learning to trust God is rehearsing what he's done before. This is the value of a testimony service, for instance, or in rehearsing your own personal testimony. It's the value of reading uh, great books about what God's done in the past. A few years ago, I was home to visit my family in Wisconsin, and both my grandmothers uh, live over there, pretty close to my parents. And I had the opportunity to sit down and talk to Granny Criswell. Um, she's my mom's mom, and we're very close. And uh, I just asked her a bunch of questions. I basically treated it like an interview. And I realized there's a lot of things about her life that I had never heard. And I said, well, I want to record these things. So I set up my phone as a camera and just recorded her life story. And let me tell you, it was absolutely incredible to hear the things that she went through in her life. And the thing that was most remarkable to me was to see how faithful God has been in her life over and over and over again over the course of 80 plus, almost 90 years now. She told her story of how she was born into a dysfunctional home. Her father was an alcoholic. Um, he barely put food on the table because he spent all his money on alcohol. She was born in a very rural part of Maryland. And um, every, every week when she, I can't remember how old she was exactly, but when she was in elementary school, 
the pastor's wife from the church up the hill came down and would pick them up and take them to church. And so she was basically a bus kid, she and her sisters, and that's how she trusted Christ. And so she went from being this bus kid from a dysfunctional alcoholic's home to growing up, seeing God work in her life. She married my grandfather, he became a pastor, and for 40 plus years, she served as a pastor's wife alongside my grandfather and saw God do incredible things. They supported missionaries all over the world. She's been to, I think, 40 some countries on missions trips. Just absolutely incredible stories of all the doors that God opened. And the thing that did for me was it reinforced in my mind that God works across generations and God works in everybody's lives. And it was so neat to see just the story of God working through my grandmother's life in ways I had just taken for granted my entire life. But you know what that did for me? It showed me that I can trust God. It showed me that God is not just this distant abstract thing who did things thousands of years ago in the Bible. He is a God who's at work in people's lives today. And that's just one example I give. That's one example that's very close and near and dear to me, of course. I'd encourage you to reflect. What is an example in your life of a way that you've seen God work, maybe in the life of someone that's close to you? And then what's a way that you've seen God work in your own life? One of the most uh, powerful things that happened to me, spiritually speaking, as I came into my young adult years, was I had a couple things I needed God to do for me. And I decided I'm not going to tell anybody this prayer request. Because I know God answers Granny's prayers, right? She was a pastor's wife for 40 years. I know God answers Grandma's prayers. She loves the Lord and walks with Him. I know God answers Mom and Dad's prayers. But does God answer my prayer? And so there's a couple different times in college where I had a need, and instead of telling a single person about it, I just told God about it. And there's nothing wrong with getting people to pray for you. I think we should get people to pray for you. But for me, this was a valuable exercise for me to say, does God actually work in my life? Can I trust God with my needs? And it was amazing to see time and time again, God start to prove himself in my life. I think that verse we sang, that song we sang a couple weeks ago that talks about how, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. What a powerful testimony. And young people, my encouragement to you is start that process now. Find ways in your life where you can start to prove God. Where you can start to say, this is something that I asked God. I didn't ask anybody else. I didn't tell a single other soul. But God came through, and I know I can trust God. The most powerful antidote to trusting men is seeing God come through for us when we trust him. When we start to work that muscle of faith, it's incredible the things that God will do in our life and the ways that it protects us from the, some of the temptations, some of the challenges, some of the frustrations that we will face in the world around us. And then uh, next we see the results of trusting God, the results of trusting God. It says there in verse, verse 8, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters. I love this next illustration. This is a beautiful picture. Um, I was thinking about this illustration that Jeremiah gives here of a tree planted by water. And the first thing I thought about was the Nichols Arboretum here in town. Has anyone been there to the Nichols Arboretum? I love going there to walk. Uh, winter, summer, fall, it's beautiful every time, all the time, uh, all through the year. Um, one of my favorite spots there is a spot down by the Huron River. And it's where the river gets especially wide and very shallow. And it runs very slowly. It's, it's calm enough for kids to play in, in the summertime. And the thing that's really incredible there is that you have these massive trees. I'm not sure what kind they are. I think they're oak trees that are right up against the edge of the river, and they're hanging over the river. They're just huge. I mean, I, I couldn't wrap my arms around them, they're so big. But what's most impressive to them, to me, is not the size of the trunks, it's not the branches, it's not the leaves, it's the roots. If you look down, if you go there today and look down, you'll see the root system is absolutely incredible on these things. It's all, they're all huge knotted tangles, and they reach down into the soil, and then they reach down into the water, and they form part of the bank, and they reach over the bank into the water. The root systems on those trees are absolutely incredible. And this is what Jeremiah is likening the person that trusts God to. He's saying, if you trust God, that's what you'll be. You'll be well-rooted. You'll be well-nourished. And so we see some of the results here. Um, this is the kind of life that's offered to us when we place our trust in God. Going back to our story of planting a tree, if you could plant a tree anywhere, why in the world would you choose to plant it here when you could plant it here? And that's exactly what God's saying to us. Why in the world would you trust man? Would you really choose this? Is this the life you really want? You could just as easily have this by trusting God. And so he's urging us, who will you trust? Will you trust in man and have a life in the desert? Or will you trust in God and have a life by the abundant waters of the river? <clears throat> Why wouldn't you plant yourself in a place of full confidence in God? When you do, you're guaranteed spiritual longevity for yourself. Your roots are running deep into the very source of life, the very creator and sustainer of life. And let me tell you, this shapes so much of the way we think about our lives. Why well, is not switching back to that river picture there? Um, we think about even the temptations that crop up in our lives. I know I've had conversations recently with um, people who don't believe in God and who haven't trusted Christ. 
And they look at people who deny themselves the pleasures of sin as if we're weird. It's really interesting. I feel like even in the past several years, um, I've seen this shift more and more in the culture, where it used to be like, oh, if you're a moral person, then I respect, I respect your self-discipline. Now the narrative is, you're weird. Why would you deny yourself all these pleasures? It's really fascinating to me how the narrative has shifted. But one of the things that helps us as we see this cultural shift happening is recognizing that this is who God says I am. When I'm rooted by the river of God's goodness for me, then why would I turn to sin? It helps us to frame our view of sin instead of thinking it as this list of fun toys that God has said, don't touch. Instead, we say, no, it's a list of poison that God has said, I know that will destroy you. I want you to have a life that's flourishing and enjoyable and amazing. And if you dabble with this stuff, it's going to take away some of that. And so when God keeps us from something, it's because he wants us to be rooted in the river. He wants us to be rooted by him. And so denying ourselves sin is not drudgery. It's not missing out on the fun times of life. It's thriving in the place that our creator has designed us to thrive. So what do you think of when you think of rootedness? I think of some things that aren't rooted. Look at our culture today. I mentioned that, how our culture has shifted so much just in the past few years. Different large cultural institutions, whether that's governmental institutions or educational institutions, are not rooted. Their values can change so quickly, and we see that happen, like I said, over the past five years. This past fall, I had the opportunity to go to the, Nether the Netherlands and see um, the village that my dad's ancestors were from. And one of the things that was most amazing to me there was going to the churchyard and seeing all the Sigma gravestones there that date back hundreds of years. And it was a feeling of rootedness. I was like, this is where my ancestors lived and worked and worshiped God and were buried. And that was such a cool feeling. Um, and it's, it's also just amazing looking at that village and thinking about how little has changed there. While the rest of the world has changed rapidly, that churchyard has been relatively untouched. It's an unchanging place. And God is calling us by his grace to root ourselves in him and experience a spiritual rootedness, a spiritual unchangedness, so that while all the priorities and values and dictates of the world shift and swirl around us, our roots are deeply planted in who God has called us to be. And so first we see that rootedness is a result of trusting God, and then we see that nourishment is a result of trusting God. Think again about the contrast here. The tree in the desert has no nourishment, so it only lasts so long. But the tree by the river has all the nourishment it can absorb and more. That's us when we trust God instead of trusting man. Instead of chasing the approval of others, instead of feeling insecure, we are drawing from the depths of God's character. And then the last result we see of trusting God is security. I love that phrase in verse 8. Look at that again. The last phrase, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. What an incredible thought. At first I thought it was just kind of a, a poetic way of expressing that it was a really healthy tree. But if you understand how fruit trees work, as soon as there's a hint of stress or a drought, the fruit tree stops making fruit. It shifts from an abundance, fruitfulness mindset to a survival mindset. And in the way the tree is made, that knows if we give these limited resources to make fruit, then the mother tree is going to die. But if, on the other hand, we stop making fruit, focus on survival, we could possibly get through this challenging time. And so what he's saying here is, you're not, whenever you're planted and rooted in trusting God, you're not just barely making it. You don't have just enough resources to survive. You have so many resources that you're producing fruit year-round. That's an incredible thought. I love picking apples. I'm sure if you've lived in Michigan, you've gone and picked apples. But they don't, they don't fruit year-round. It's a once-a-year thing. Imagine how incredible it would be to have an, a beautiful apple tree in your backyard fruiting year-round. I would love to have that. Um, but that's what he's saying here. That's the picture he's drawing here, that in a supernatural way, whenever you decide to put your trust in God instead of put your trust in man, you have so much strength and so many resources, you're able to produce spiritual fruit year-round. The fruit of the Spirit flows out of you. Spiritual transformation happens in the lives of the people that, you're touched, that, that you touch and that you're burdened for. This is the kind of life that God's calling us to. So again, why would we choose to plant our tree in the desert when this is the kind of life, this is the kind of abundance that Christ is offering us? That's what, th this is us when we trust God instead of trusting man. Instead of living in insecurity and worrying about the opinions of people around me, I'm free to openly demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. I'm free to invest in and serve and help others. So what are some ways in which we should trust God? I think, uh, as I think about my life and the ways that I need to trust God, there's three simple categories. And I'm not going to expand on these, but just three simple categories. First is trust what he says about himself. What God says about himself is true, and he's always working good in my life. Trust what he says about me. Again, it's so easy for us to believe our own feelings, to believe our own narrative that we told ourselves. 
And instead, we root ourselves and anchor ourselves in God by saying, I believe what God says about me more than I believe how I feel about myself. And so we root ourselves in God by trusting what he says about me. And then finally, we trust what he says about the world around me. Again, the world is screaming many things at us that simply are not true, but are very trendy and very popular. And so our burden then is to go to God's word and say, okay, God, what do I know about you that informs the way I think about the world around me? What do I know about you that informs the way I think about the circumstances I'm going through, about the, the narrative I'm being told? And so we constantly go back to God and say, God, how can I trust you more in the way I view you and the way I view myself and in the way I view the world around me? And that's how we find ourselves deeply rooted in who God is. So when I think about this, I mean, we talk about this whole idea of trusting God versus trusting man. Some people will say, well, how should we interact with people then? We're commanded not to put our trust in them. So does this mean that we should view people with skepticism? Should we be fundamentally distrusting of people around us? I've known Christians like this. I've known Christians who take this approach that say, no, we're supposed to trust God, not trust man, so I don't, I don't trust anybody. Everyone's out to get me. And they have this, this cynical approach to life. That's not what God's calling us to. Instead, when our trust is in God, it gives me a deep security with who he is, who I am, and who others are. And so I don't need to derive my identity from others. I don't depend on validation or affirmation from others. So here's what happens. As I put my trust in God, I'm then free and secure and confident to turn around and face the people around me and say, I don't need your affirmation to find my identity. I don't need your approval to feel my self-worth. Instead, I'm able to be so anchored and rooted in who God, has said, who God says I am that I'm free to love you and serve you and be generous to you and be good to you, even as annoying as you can be to me. This actually gives us true freedom to serve people and to love people because my trust is not in that person. My identity is not wrapped up in that person. My value is not found in what that person thinks of me. My value is so firmly rooted in who God says I am that I am completely free to serve and to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit and to draw someone to Christ in every way in that person's life. So in conclusion, when I'm trusting God, here's what it does for me. It infuses my life with a deep security in who he is, who I am, and who others are. So I don't need to derive my identity from others. I don't depend on validation or affirmation from others. And then when I'm trusting God, it frees me up to genuinely love and serve people around me. I can enter relationships so secure in who I am that I'm prepared to give and to serve even the most needy people. And then when I'm trusting God, it allows me to stand confidently in my identity as a follower of Christ, regardless of what it might cost me. Don't you just love people who are real? I know I do. I think of a handful of people in my life I know that will always tell me the truth every time, even when it hurts. And that's valuable. I need those people in my life. I want to be that kind of person. Nothing to hide, nothing to prove. Just completely confident in my God and who he's called me to be. Look down, if you will, as we close at verses 9 and 10. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. This is the invitation. When I think about the ways that I'm tempted to trust mankind, I know how subtly it can happen. So oftentimes, before I even know it, I've turned my confidence away from God and put my confidence into man. I've turned to other people for security and, trusting, and I started trusting them. So time and time again, I have to look to God and ask for him to search my heart, ask for him to try, to try my motives and to show me where my trust is misplaced. If these nine men that were on the Lady Be Good could speak to us today, they'd have one message for us. Trust your instruments. At the end of the day, their instruments did them no good because they did not rely on them. There's one thing that no instrument can do. It can't force you to depend on it. God offers himself to us as the most perfect, reliable, consistent source of security. It's up to you to trust him.